So the title is the SQL Server 2016 HTAB performance and it was Windows Server 2016 and HP persistent memory. And so the presenter, there are two of us. I'm Lindsay Allen with SQL Server Engineering and uh, Tobias Klima with uh, Windows Server Engineering. And we have our HP friend in front. You want to introduce yourself? Thank you. So which H tab? I had that in small font. There it says hybrid transaction processing and analytics processing. It's named by Gardner Analyst, so it's official H tab. We coded all sorts of different names before, and it's something people have been doing for 30 years. I'm pretty sure you're doing it as well. Uh, because uh, normally when you have application, you code the data warehouse, and somebody went, wants, ran some transaction on it. And then you have a database is supposed to be transaction processing. Then your boss want to run some reports on it because you want real time, right? So it's been happening for 30 years. Then the challenge is the performance is problem. These two types of workload conflicting with each other, right? But today, technology changed, very, uh, changed dramatically you can actually comfortably running this two type of workload together on the same database. So your analytics can be real time. So this is just the agenda. There are two portions of it, right? First, I want to explain HTAB and what we have with SQL Server 2016 to support HTAB. And uh, then we're going to show you some demos on the actually hardware technology, the next generation of servers from HP can actually make HTAB workload run really fast. So definition, hybrid, transaction, and analytics processing. So run your OLTP and OLAP together. So there's no pure transaction database. There's no pure data warehouse, very rare. And generally, for the real app, they run together. So when they run together, the reason is you want real time, like fraud detection, for example, or you're running a production uh, manufacturing system, you want to know that uh, the yield defect on that uh, production line, real time, right? If the defect affecting the actual whole line, you need to shut it down or not, you, or you can wait for a day. So not all analytics can wait for a day. And uh, so this allows you have the OLAP analytics query to access real time data. So no stale data in this case, right? And we specifically invested in this scenario in SQL Server 2016. So we believe SQL Server 2016 is the best HTAB engine for your database applications. And we have, we support, we have three engines, right? We support in-memory row store, in-memory column store. We also have uh, uh, on-disk row store. All the three combinations, they actually work, work together. They're really in the same engine, same interface, and so they work really well together. Uh, so let me just take back in time just uh, uh, for a couple minutes. So the traditional analytics architecture, and because all because of actual performance, right? You don't want your workload to conflict. And you will have your application and you have your presentation layer, either the old uh, you know, uh, UI from MFC or you fancy the new web application using AngularJS. And you have your presentation layer, that's what the user sees, right? And web or a model dialogs box. And talk to some sort of a middle tier server, web browsers, uh, uh, web servers or application tier, then have uh, some data access application server. We'll talk to SQL Server uh, as a database server, right? This part, normally, you have lots of user, highly concurrent, and uh, sends lots of little transactions through your UI layer to database. And uh, you want to write really fast, update, update insert really fast, right? For all that data, just take example of uh, credit card transactions, right? Everybody have Visa, MasterCard, or something. You go to the merchant, you, you buy, uh, maybe buy some uh, coffee from Starbucks, and that transaction will write to a database server. And uh, uh, 
that transaction you want it to happen fast. If you sit there waiting for, you know, take forever, what's happening, right? You want it to happen fast. And the merchant want to collect your money really fast. Um, but they also want to know if your credit card is real, right? So uh, Visa, American Express, MasterCard, they all have a very extensive team actually building fraud detection. Um, they don't want your credit card get stolen. They have to forfeit the money, right? Because they have a guarantee. You're a good customer. You don't, get, you don't have to pay for stolen uh, credit card transactions. So they want to do that really fast. So traditional architecture is they were actually moving the data on minutes, hourly basis, like per transaction basis, to a data mart or data warehouse, then run the fraud detection algorithm on it. Because the fraud detection, like all machine learning, right? It's scanning, scanning the entire table or doing a range scan based on your user ID, region, or what have you, right? Um, because fraud detection is largely based on detecting a pattern. So if your pattern is, uh, does not match your regular activity, I bet you're, you're traveling, if you forgot to tell your bank you're traveling, sometimes they suspend your credit card, right? So it's, What's happening yesterday, you're in Bellevue and today in, in Atlanta, and uh, probably it's not real, let's just suspend it, right? So they want to do this as fast as possible, detecting a pattern. So to avoid conflict from taking money from your credit card and uh, tell you it's a fraud, so they run this into separate systems. And so the replication ETL moved to another relational data warehouse to run fraud detection, doesn't matter how fast you move, the data is stale, right? You, you could take a minute, it's one minute old. A couple of seconds, a couple of seconds old, right? For the best system I see, you can move data in five to 10 minutes in large volume. Um, so that means your, your data in data warehouse still in five, 10 minutes late. Then on data warehouse, you run BI, you run analytics, you run your scripts. And if you have analysts want to do whatever analytics they want, and they want actually better response, right? You insert your cubes there. Analysis services, put a cube in there, and you do what if analysis, everything's awesome. Then the key problem, as I mentioned, you see the whole thing is, is complex because you got all the actual server going. You need the actual server run the ETL, and you need extra server run the cubes, you need extra server run data warehouse, and then they are copy of the data, right? And imagine Serbian Oxley auditing time, the SOX people shows up, and now you get a proof to them, your data, the copy of data in data warehouse matches your data transaction in your ODS, right? So um, introduce lots of complexity, um, more floor space, electricity, all that, and uh, on top of delay. And uh, data latency analytics, and uh, most business just one real time. Because if you give your boss um, 10 minutes, they want five, and uh, two minutes, they want seconds, so seconds are down to microseconds, everybody want real time, right? So might as well build your system for real time. So with HTAB, what we did, the reason for the conflicts is why you store data, right, in the storage engine? Doesn't matter which relational database vendor. And the data stored in pages. And uh, when you actually, one thing relational engine does really well is we guarantee your data is consistent, right? The whole asset property of transaction. And we promise your data writes in saved into SQL Server will come out the same way. So it's one, will come back one. And uh, we're, we're guarantee the data is to stay true, right, through the whole process. And in order to do that, computer have this thing called synchronization objects, latches, locking, because we don't want the two threads actually modify at the same time, become non-deterministic, right? In order to guarantee deterministic, we have to synchronize, synchronize the, through the lock, through the latch. Doesn't matter how effective these are, there's conflict, right? Because uh, uh, one thread doing it, even split seconds, even in microseconds, the other thread has to wait. And because of this synchronization object causing conflict of your uh, transaction, uh, workload have to wait for other shared uh, log to finish, right? Then the causing slowdown. So what we did is, uh, since we have three engines, 
And uh, in this database, we added something called a column store index. We call it a column store index, but actually it is a columnar storage for your same data. We allow you to create it as index. So the, the implication of the syntax is we will actually maintain it for you as if it's index. So it's automatic. It's not a separate store. You have a row, right? A row-based table. If you pick three columns or entire, uh, all the columns in the table, create a column store index on it, and uh, we will actually create a copy just as index and uh, maintain it for you. And, and in SQL Server 2016, it's updatable. So all these are transparent to your application because our query optimizer knows your data either in column store or in row store, and uh, we will actually take your scan, like a query doing scanning, that's analytics query, we use the column store. So physically, they're not actually stored together, so that you're not gonna share the same latch. You don't really have that conflict anymore. The only, uh, the only resource you're sharing is physical CPU on the box, right? And in that case, you can buy a bigger box. And it's still real time, you just need a bigger box. It's still actually more efficient than two boxes. Um, so this way, your BI and analytics can run against SQL Server, against the same database, and with a minimal impact on your transaction throughput. I say minimum impact is because it is running on the same database, right, and the same processor. If you don't affinitize it properly, you still have to wait for scheduler. The runnable queue still has to be scheduled. And if you want, you can keep your schemas, right, the metadata, the computations in the cube through a tabular mode and do pass through run against SQL Server. One query come to us, through the cube, we know it's analytics. We're just gonna hit column store. And uh, so this way, and uh, it's real time. Because you see, we actually maintain that column store as indexes. So it's a real time, no stale data for your analytics. So benefit, there's no data latency. The minute you write, you can read it. And our query optimizer for the, for the data hasn't get a compressed column store yet. It's in the tail, still in the uh, delta row group it will be joined with the query optimizer will pick up the uh, delta portion. It's just the, the tail just got inserted. And uh, don't need to do ETL for your real-time analytics. For your giant uh, enterprise data warehouse, you probably still want to do that, right? You come from all different data sources. But for, for analytics, just on that ODS, you don't need to do ETL anymore. And you don't need to just build a separate data warehouse or data mart or something. and. Uh, just to run reports, right? Of course, the biggest challenge is minimize the performance impact. And instead of I'm getting to tell you all the details, um, I think yesterday Kevin Farley had a presentation got into all the details of implementation of our column store. So what I'll do instead, I'll just show you a few demos. Um, let me uh, see if I managed to connect or not. Okay, my direct access is not working. I tried to access the server back, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, back in our lab to show you a demo, and uh, my network is not connecting, and um, Microsoft policy not allow me to do VPN. So I have a recording, luckily. So Intel has a uh, database performance team let me pause this. Let me explain what this is. Actually, I, I'll run this and show you. So what they did is um, they took the older version of a SQL Server just row store, this one on the bottom showing SQL Server 14, and the uh, same database, right? And the one on top uh, showing SQL Server 16 does have column store. And what we're doing here is actually there's a transaction workload running. You see the bottom? It, this, uh, uh, we have actually um, OLTP transaction running on the two machines, same transaction. Come on, okay. And uh, then run six analytics queries on top of uh, both machines. So same workload. So as you can see, uh, what's showing here, system one, system two, your total aggregated time take to complete the data warehouse uh, workload on this one same transaction is running, right? 
So on the uh, Broadwell machine with uh, the uh, operational analytics, so HTAP feature of SQL 2016 is already finished, 26 seconds. And, uh, and the transaction they reported back, it did per minute, OLTP transaction did about 260,000 transactions. And uh, the, uh, the row store and without uh, the uh, column store index, um, the updatable column store index. And uh, you see the uh, data warehouse workload, the six still running, because it's keep get blocked by the, uh, uh, by the lock on the pages, right? When you keep doing insert, uh, SQL Server uh, treat all the lock latches equal, right? So it's first come, first serve. So whoever gets in the queue, grab the lock, and the second request coming need to wait, right? Uh, so it's just showing the data warehouse got blocked, and I think it's affecting uh, OLTP transaction as well, because I issued the the data warehouse query when transaction tried to come in. And it's uh, 99 seconds, 100 seconds is still going. It's almost done. Uh, so huge difference, right? It's still running. I promise it does finish. It just take a while. OK, it's finished. So as you can see, the per minute, per minute transaction is less than half. The, uh, the, the OLTP transaction is less than half. And uh, the overall data warehouse uh, workload take away longer, I don't know, they're 26 seconds versus 112 seconds, right? This is one of the reasons, um, generally, the IT manager never run these two workloads together. But now you can. You don't see there's much uh, performance difference. You can run transaction workload together with your analytics workload. So I'll come back here. So I showed you the demo. And uh, uh, then we have, I mentioned, right, we have uh, in-memory uh, OLTP technology as well. So this is in-memory row store. It's a main memory resident. These rows never go off, right? This is like uh, times 10, or MemSQL, MemSQL, actually all previous SQL people building it. Uh, and uh, so for main memory um, database, in memory OTP, we actually don't latch. We don't actually do any latch or locking. It's lock free. So transaction goes really fast. But the challenge is it does not serve uh, data warehouse query very well, right? Because it's only memory. And they have a, a limited number of indexes you can add. So in SQL 2016 for HTAB, we allow you to add column store, in memory column store as a part of in-memory OLTP database and tables. So this allows you to actually keep just basically everything in memory. If you have some time-sensitive uh, low latency requirements for your workload, just run everything in memory, right? So for this one, instead of, you know, in-memory OLTP, generally you can see 10, 10 times or 30 times performance improvement compared to your disk-based. And uh, for the column store, because we did uh, so much change, right, in the engine, and uh, for lots of query, you see 100 times performance improvement for the query. So now you can put them together. And uh, so instead, uh, do a demo. So we have a customer in production. It's a Dell IT. Um, they have 2,000-some instances of SQL Server they, they need to monitor, right? They, they actually need to monitor way more. They just monitor lots of their instances, thousands thousands of databases, and uh, then other applications as well, right? So they have agents sitting on this server collecting lots of telemetry, right? What's running on it, resource usage, and uh, who is using it. And so uh, including security access, everything. And, uh, before, they have to, on the, on the, uh, the yellow pass, that's their traditional pass. They basically will have a separate server. They have the box uh, agent and they try to uh, send the data back to a central location. And this box, it's a SQL server, will try to process data because it needs to be aggregated, right? Just telemetry itself, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense because they have whole dashboard monitoring. And take just more than four hours even just to collect all the data from 2,000 servers. And uh, this is a daily thing, right? Then take another more than six hours just to 
do the ETL transformation on there to do aggregation and insert back to the same database. This is on the same server. So the data collection and ET ETL job fight with each other, right? So sometimes it takes like literally more than 10 hours. They can't finish this process. Then for average query, it takes more than a minute to run. And uh, this actually, if you're monitoring process, it takes more than, more than 10 hours. So you're not really monitoring much. It's quite delayed, right? So they, they took, they changed everything to in-memory. So they're going to do, they did data collection from in-memory, and it takes about 40 minutes from all the server because it includes all the network latency. And uh, then took a, about 12 minutes to aggregate everything through column store. And then the query itself, so this is all ongoing. The dashboard um, to run analytics query takes sec nine seconds on average. So like a huge improvement, right? They see like a 10x performance. Um, as soon as they got this app running, they said, okay, that's it, we're going to production. So they went into production on our CTP2 like before we release. So that's one of their IT manager, uh, Ronaldo, gave us a quote, and uh, this is his flow chart as well. So because now they can run so fast, so they're collecting more data as well. So now let me invite uh, uh, Tobias to come to uh, talk about persistent memory and SQL Server and the Windows. Excellent. Thank you, Lindsay. So I, let me start with an assumption. My assumption here is that you guys are interested in the session because you want to make your SQL instances run faster. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. If that's not the case, let me know, and then we need to speak about something else. But so far, we haven't really talked about persistent memory, so that's the piece I'll be covering in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Think about the following problem statement. I want to make my SQL instance run faster. I want to be able to push more transactions, and I want to be able to do it at a lower latency. There's a couple options you've had so far to do that. Either you could throw more CPU at the system. You could go from two sockets to four sockets, which is a new box. You could drop in new uh, CPUs that have more cores or are at a higher clock frequency. You could upgrade your memory. If you can fit more of your database or your indexes into memory, your database will run faster, sure. You could upgrade your storage. That was your bottleneck. You have your log on hard drives. It's probably not going to go very fast. You can swap in SATA SSDs. If you really want to push it, you put in, in PCIe SSDs. So that's NVMe flash that is available today. With the release of Windows Server 16 and SQL Server 16, you have a new option, which comes in somewhere in between more memory and faster storage. And that is specifically the use of persistent memory with a preview feature in SQL 16 called Tail of Log. So Rather than explaining right now how it works, let me actually go to a demo. And as Lindsay mentioned, because we can't get into our servers in Redmond right now, I'll use this video. What I'm doing here is I'm running simple updates. It's an, a workload that just does updates, inserts and updates uh, in an in-memory SQL database. The database is in memory. The log, of course, still is on a persistent medium. So the log, in this case, is on an NVMe SSD. It's the fastest drive I could get my hands on at the time. Uh, and that's going to be my, my baseline. Before looking at the perf results, take a look at the CPU utilization. I couldn't really push it past 63%. And at the same time, the shaded area is the kernel time. So the time spent in the Windows kernel, in the I.O. stack, doing context switches, not processing SQL transactions. The second run that is going on right now is actually using this new tail of log functionality, which is in preview, on the NVDIM. You see the results here. I'm able to now actually go to 100% CPU utilization, and I'm spending less time in the kernel, meaning I'm making more progress actually processing my transactions. And I think the results speak from themselves. I basically just doubled the throughput of my in-memory database doing updates and inserts, and I cut the latency in half. I hope that is at least somewhat exciting to you guys. From here, let's look at how this actually works. To give you an idea of this, we need to go back and think about how does SQL actually construct transactions today. That's the upper part here, labeled in the past. SQL actually has log buffers that are sitting directly in memory. So as an update comes into the database engine, an entry is put into that log buffer 
and they're just collected there in memory until a commit transaction comes in. That means this needs to be committed. All this data that's in DRAM right now needs to be hardened. So grab it, seal it, write it down to the SSD. And that is what you saw in the demo. As soon as that commit comes in and the log buffer is sealed and written out to SSD, we send an I.O. down the Windows storage stack. We do a kernel, um, user mode kernel switch, write that out, and then come back up the stack saying, yes, it's done, yes, it's done, yes, it's done, SQL, you're good, this has been hardened. That means SQL is waiting there until that I.O.'s happened and cores might be spinning and not actually doing any, any work. That is the reason I couldn't push past 63% CPU utilization. The fact, though, is you guys paid for that CPU core when you bought it. You didn't, you didn't pay Intel or AMD money to only use 60% of this core, right? Now, what does the tail of log functionality do? In fact, what the SQL team, team did, which is really cool, they took those log buffers, and instead of having them in DRAM, they put it on the NVDIMM, which is persistent. So now, the same thing happens. A transaction comes in, it's put in the log buffer, and at a certain point in time, a commit comes in, meaning this has to be hardened. The nice thing is, because the NVDIMM is persistent, they can immediately turn around and say, all my transactions are done, because I'm not going to lose these in case of a power outage. They are persisted on the NVDIMM. That's where the performance comes from. Now they don't have to seal the log buffer right away. They can actually fill it up all the way until you have a 60 or 64K chunk, and then that entire chunk is written out to the log file on the NVMe SSD. You're essentially getting rid of the latency that the SSD, the block device underneath, exposes to SQL because you're masking it with the NVDIMM in front of it. This has two results. One, you get quicker commits because they turn around immediately. And two, you actually do less I.O. to the SSD, meaning you're spending less time in the Windows kernel going through the storage stack waiting for acknowledgments. And this is the side benefit that comes out of this. Because you write larger chunks to your SSD, every single one of these will be about 60 kilobytes, you get more parallelism out of your NAND, which typically results in higher throughput. So what enables all of this? We actually made this possible in Windows Server 2016. So with help from HPE, we're actually able to stand this support up. In Windows Server 16, we have native drivers for NVDIMM end devices. You might wonder, OK, these are sitting on the DRAM bus directly, on the memory bus. So how do they show up in Windows? How do I manage them? Because most people say, OK, this is really cool. You can give me a fast SQL database, but I need to manage these devices through their lifetime. So here's the answer to that. The top right screenshot is actually disk management. So these NVDIMMs are exposed to you as disk devices. Even though they're sitting on the memory bus and they have a byte addressable interface, for easy use, by default, we'll create a block emulation layer, and it looks like a hard drive or an SSD. It's just really, really fast. You can see that at the, at the bottom left in the performance chart. Even when I go through the block stack, I still get an average 4K write, uh, latency of about five microseconds. To put that in perspective, writing to an NVMe SSD, I need about 60 to 70 microseconds. And not too many people have them deployed yet. What more people have deployed are SATA SSD, and that's where you're looking at 300 microseconds of latency. Now, we didn't want to stop there, though, because by going through the block stack, we're essentially wasting performance potential of this device that's sitting on the memory bus. So why not address it like memory? And that's where file system changes come in that we made in Windows Server 16 as well. You can now go and format an NTFS file system for what's termed DAX mode or direct access mode. The idea is actually fairly simple. We want to give your application, or in this case, SQL Server, the ability to address the physical ranges of this DIMM directly, not having to go through the kernel. The way we enabled this is that SQL Server can go in, recognize that it has a DAX mode volume that its log buffers are sitting on, and memory map them. In the past, what we would do for memory mapping is grab what's on disk, load it into system memory, and hand you a pointer to that system memory so you can now modify it. We don't have to do this anymore. We have a byte addressable store underneath us. So when you memory map something on a DAX volume, you get a pointer directly to those memory ranges, and your app can modify it directly. And the result of that is we bypass completely the storage stack in Windows, and the result is directly below in the performance chart again. With a single core, 
I can drive about 1.67 million IOPS. And I'm doing it at an average latency of 500 nanoseconds. That is DRAM speed. And that is where the benefits come from that SQL can then build on. Of course, as I said, we didn't just do this in a vacuum by ourselves. We were actually very fortunate that we were able to do this together with HP. And in case you're wondering what the hardware was that we used, it's listed here. It was an HP ProLine Gen 9 server. Uh, the CPUs weren't super high end. So even though I didn't use the highest end CPUs or four socket box, I got significant throughput out of this. Um, and we used the, the NVDIMS there as well. Now, if you want to learn more about memory mapping, about NVDIMS in Windows, have a look at the reference material down here. There are two Channel 9 talks that I did earlier this year, which tell you more about the architecture, about how this works in Windows. And there is a talk that Lindsay and I actually got up there fairly recently about exactly this, tail of log, the tail of log preview in SQL. And now back to Lindsay. So let's uh, uh, look forward a bit. Uh, so you know those, those servers with such great performance with NVMe and HP coming up with something even better in the future. And uh, so I'll let them disclose what's going to come up, but I'm going to show you, give you uh, some preview what we have here, right? You know those two socket server with uh, MEDIM in there with Windows, new Windows 2016, you can cluster them together. Oh, my machine went to sleep. Come on. Sorry. So with the new... Uh, Windows Server Spaces Direct cluster. And uh, you can put just this one, actually literally put eight of them together. And each of them have uh, uh, two MVDIM, um, MVDIM cards in there. And you can configure them just as a block. And uh, for the sake of you know, demonstrate SQL workload, right? This is out of the eight server. And this uh, uh, MVDIM is in there. And uh, you can aggregate them into one shared volume and access from any server. And then instead of uh, run these 4K um, IOs, right, I said, let's do something a little bit more real, the 8K random IOs. And uh, for uh, Data Warehouse, we do 64K. If you do concurrent thread, 32 concurrent thread, 64K IO. And you can see on MEME, it, uh, it does about uh, 3 gigabytes per second, 59 um, IOPS reads, right, on 64K. Of course, larger. Uh, larger block writes, and uh, you get uh, less IOPS. Then on the same thing, if you write, write on the uh, uh, SCM on the MVDM volume, these are actually fairly small uh, sizes. It's 11 gigabytes per second on the way more uh, IOPS. So let's run the uh, 8Ks, right? That's probably your transaction and uh, throughput mix with uh, 8020 and uh, read-write mix. That's the general um, patterns. Similar thing on uh, MEME, you see the performance, and uh, you see it double, more than, actually, a lot more than double, and uh, on the uh, 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 storage class memory performance. So you can put these uh, fairly uh, commodity servers, two socket servers together as a very high speed send uh, for your uh, work, um, high performance workload, right? So now let's actually look at the real workload, and you look at the HD version. So we have the, uh, the workload, and now you can see side by side. I'll pause for just a second. Side by side, there are two servers. The one on the, uh, <coughs> on the left-hand side are the uh, uh, next generation of HP server with more capacity of persistent memory. On the right-hand side, it's uh, the next generation server, but with, a, with a just a, a MEME SSD drives. And we load the same version of SQL Server 2016, Windows Server 2016 on it, run a workload called CH. Basically, it's HTAP workload. And um, so now let's start this. We need to start by just starting SQL Server on both sides and manually so we don't have any overhead. And uh, those start equal, uh, equally nicely. And, uh, Now you can see SQL Server grab all the memory. 
on the uh, persistent memory grabbed uh, th three terabytes. And uh, now, actually, part of those three terabytes are actually allocated as um, for SQL Server to use to store data. This not buffer pool cache actually is user data and uh, persisted. So we're going to launch a load driver. You can see on the bottom, both sides. So we're going to start on the transaction workload only. This is just like your accounting and uh, credit card transactions, right? And uh, you can see it's a ramps up and the CPU on both sides. And uh, it looked a little nicer on the uh, persistent memory, have less kernel time as well. You see the kernel time actually 2% with, uh, with the direct have to write through I.O. And you always see more kernel time. And uh, then the, uh, um, the actual online transaction processing, we're going to see the chart. It uh, ramps up and uh, nicely on both sides. I think you will see pretty even. Uh, we're going to wait for it to taper out the plateau because the, the driver will start in ramp up transaction. We'll let it stabilize. Then we're going to add the data warehouse transaction on it, right? Analytics transaction. So you see 44,000 transactions per second. This is a single server, single two socket server, not big server. And now um, we're fairly stable now, and we're going to add a data warehouse transaction. The same six. The data warehouse query I showed you at earlier um, a demo through the Intel performance. As you can see, now we are pushing CPU up on both sides. And most importantly, you can see the non persistent memory. See how nice it is. Where did it just went away? It's a state of flight line. And on the, uh, um, on the regular uh, SSD, you have to go through the I.O. pass. It had a bump and they dropped back down, right? So with, with the persistent memory configuration on your two socket server, you literally see there's no impact on your, analytic, uh, on your transaction workload by running analytics workload on it. And, uh, and with uh, regular I.O., even super, super fast, you see some impact. And of course, we did this thanks to Terry, which is not, she, he's not here, our friends at HP uh, Engineering, and did all these hard work. And Jimmy did all the hard work to get all the workload running on both of these new machines. So we're, we've been partnering very closely together with HP. So that's end of our presentation. And the times, we have five minutes for questions. Thank you. Just come up. Go ahead and ask questions either at the mics or you can come up as well. So the, the question was, what about hypervisors, basically? How do they interact with persistent memory, right? Um, so Hyper-V doesn't yet support exposing persistent memory directly in VMs. Um, what you can do is, if you wish to do so, is you can create, you can, since they're exposed as a block device in Windows, you can create a VHD on it and hand that up to a VM. But we're not yet at a point where you can expose it directly in a VM. But it, we know it's technically possible, and we're thinking about when and how to enable that. Yeah, so that's uh, the, uh, we're actually working with uh, the uh, Hyper-V team, and uh, uh, we don't have a schedule, but it's being actively worked on by our engineering team, uh, because we will need the Hyper-V support of uh, persistent memory to run in Azure. And you see earlier, we got uh, SRIOV to run in Azure, basically bypass the host in Azure for network stack, right? <laughs> So now we need the persistent memory to be directly accessed from Hyper-V. That's in the works. Yeah. Right. So, so the recovery actually works exactly the same way. So the. Uh, uh, the log cache, we know it's logged uh, persistently, and that's actually going to get right to the disk as well. So if you crash, right? So we know what's actually being hardened on the disk, 
we go back and read the difference, because it's LSN, right, or our log is sequenced, we'll, we'll read the difference between what's on the disk and what's in the NVDM, and uh, we will roll forward the difference, then we continue the rest of recovery. Yes, yeah, and uh, there's something where in the works allow allow the your database to be instantly recovered, um, but that's a ways out. We haven't finished. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, with the tail of the log, what do I need to know about sizing? Because clearly, 8 gigabytes of an MVDIM doesn't hold the entire log. Exactly right. So again, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, demo and in the explanation, what's being stored on the NVDIM is actually just the log buffers. And the log buffers themselves only, con only eat up about 20 megabytes. Not even gigabytes, megabytes. That's all that's needed. And that's, again, usually would be sitting DRAM if you don't have persistent memory. In this case, that can sit on an NVDIM, so you still have over seven gigabytes of that NVDIM left over. That is correct. You could, you could put multiple tails of logs from multiple databases on that NVDIM. Yes? Yep. So if, if it's just for SQL Server data, NVDIM still replicate the same way. We still replicate through the log. Yes, another question. So the, the question was, what happens to my max memory capacity on the server if I use NVDIMs? It, it, it is reduced because we're not adding DIM slots, right? So the, the NVDIM, and you can, you can come to the booth in the expo. I know you've actually been there, but it fits into a completely regular DDR4 DIM slot where you would otherwise just put a memory DIM. Exactly the same form factor, that's where your NVDIMs go. So at that point, the question for you becomes, as you order hardware, do you actually fill up every single DIM slot, at which point you need to make that trade off, or do you have DIM slots to spare? And how much persistent memory do you put in there, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Dell. Um, yeah, uh, so we've been working with Dell for many releases, uh, this IT, right, and Dell.com uh, monitoring all the systems. And uh, they've been having this monitoring problem as their, their estate grow bigger and bigger, more and more servers. And uh, the monitoring and the analytics just can't keep up. And so, yeah, we, we made the recommendation. We tried it out. They were very happy, just went to production, yeah. Yeah, so the question is what happens when you have a hardware failure and you want to move a DIM from one server to another? Assuming the server is the same one that you move it to, it should just work because what we have on the NVDIM is an NTFS file system, right? So it would be similar to unplugging a hard drive with a full NTFS file system on one side and plugging it into another server. Right. Or if you use the storage space direct, right, it's, it's already um, uh, configured as cluster shared volume. So you can define the fault tolerance. By default, I think there's three copies. And uh, then they're all virtually available to the volume is visible to all the nodes. And uh, then the chances you can take basically two failures, right? You still have your data, yeah. Right, so the question was, does storage spaces direct support using NVDIMs as block devices or also in another mode. Right now, it doesn't actually support NVDIMs. So what you saw was more of a science experiment that we did as we finished our NVDIM bring up in Windows Server. And we know that we can use them. And to answer your question directly, right now it would only work as a block device. Because Storage Spaces Direct relies on the fact that I.O. travels down the storage stack, so it can then be split sent over RDMA to remote nodes. If we bypass the storage stack, you can't replicate anything. 
because there is no I.O., right? An app does a direct access. It does a load store memory command. There's nothing to intercept anywhere. Um, but the server team is looking at how can this be used in the future. And apparently, we're getting kicked out. <laughs> so Thanks. if you have more questions, we can take them outside. Um, Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for attending.